We know that brain development is far from finished when kids are born. But on the other hand, it's amazing when kids are born. <laughs> they already do a huge number of things. They know when kids are born how to look at faces, and they do look at faces, and they've never seen a face. So how do you build that into a brain? A kid that's in, in utero for nine months and his brain comes out and it's wired to look at faces. I have a, a ultrasound picture of my first grandchildren and he's in utero with his eyes wide open. That's spooky. <laughs> it was a, one of those 3D ultrasounds, but he's still not seeing a face and he comes out and he's looking at faces. If you put a newborn on the mom's tummy, the kid will squirm and, and move and actually can find the breast and get attached uh, by themselves with no learning. But I mean, they, that's built into them. They look at you with your eyes. Though not only do they know faces, but they have those big wide eyes and they look at you. And that changes people that look at them. I mean, you can't be with a brand new newborn really without sort of being affected. But it's far from complete all kinds of development has to happen yet. Most animals are born with much more complete brains. The baby horse gets up and walks around and does all kinds of things, but babies are not there yet. And we know some of the reasons, and all of you that are moms know exactly some of the reasons, because we don't want their brain any bigger before they come out. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty big enough. We don't want to let them stay in for 18 months until they're a little further gone. Um, those are all real reasons why human birth process kind of limits what we can do, but also, just as important, we're social animals. We are connected to other social animals. We're like wolves in a lot of ways. Wolves run in packs, they pair off about pair bonding. Everyone in the pack plays in rough houses with each other and they kind of socially build bonds to each other. They all support each other by food. You know, wolves are a good, a good model for us. At least they're doing a lot of things we're doing and, and we can kind of understand social animal. Well, we're one of those. We're also like naked mole rats. Uh, I'd ra much rather be the wolf. But, but uh, the reason I use naked mole rats is, is that's a little mammal that uh, doesn't have any hair and crawls around in the dark, but they pair bond for life. And we have done a lot of research on what that is. And we know some of the hormonal aspects of pair bonding because we study pair bonding. We can study their brain, what's missing, what happens if they don't have things. So we know a lot about it from pair bonding and studies of naked mole rats. I still like wolves better, but I guess they're harder to study. So we require our pack to develop those social functions. So we can't develop all those in utero. You know, it's hard to say can't because we can get faces without seeing a face, but we really can't build all the social connectedness we need. And that's all coming in those first years. And we know now that brain isn't even finished till after early 20s and still is still some development. And then of course we can change our brain in our whole life. So it never really completely closes, but the architecture of the brain, and that's a term I think just get real familiar with because people are talking about much more. The architecture, the way the brain is connected to each other, or the things in the brain are connected, how they're built, what cells are where, and what they're connected to, that all has to come after birth by connecting to people, attachments. I want to show just a real short little snippet from this video from the Harvard uh, Child development uh, has really done a lot of good, uh, good research um, and good educational videos. But this is a little one, and just pay attention to how neurons are strengthened and how neurons are pruned. That concept of prune means connections that are there go away. A child's experiences during the earliest years of life have a lasting impact on the architecture of the developing brain. Genes provide the basic blueprint, but experiences shape the process that determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period of brain development, billions of brain cells called neurons send electrical signals to communicate with each other. These connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace and are reinforced through repeated use. Our experiences and environment dictate which circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more permanent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away through a normal process called pruning. 
Well-used circuits create lightning-fast pathways for neural signals to travel across regions of the brain. Simple circuits form first, providing a foundation for more complex circuits to build on later. Through this process, neurons form strong circuits and connections for emotions, motor skills, behavioral control, logic, language, and memory during the early critical period of development. With repeated use, these circuits become more efficient and connect to other areas of the brain more rapidly. While they originate in specific areas of the brain, the circuits are interconnected. You can't have one type of skill without the others to support it. Like building a house, everything is connected, and what comes first forms a foundation for all that comes later. So that's a really um, important concept. It's use it or lose it. Our brains are built that way. It's a very efficient way because if we're not using part of our brain, that brain can redirect itself and become something else. And that's needed sometimes, but use it or lose it. It's easy to see this in a very concrete thing uh, where kids have crossed eyes. If kids' eyes are crossed, they see double. And so I try to make a double on that stop sign. You can cross your eyes and it won't stick like your mom said. You can just try it out. You see two of everything and it's kind of disconcerting, but you can pay attention to just one of them. I can look at just the right image and not the left and just pay attention to one. And that's what kids do because it's really disturbing to see two of everything. So they pick one and pay attention to it. And then the eye that they're not paying attention to, the brain cells go away. So they actually prune that set of brain cells and they become cortically blind in that eye. So if kids are seeing double and we just let them see double, they'll fix it themselves. They'll just prune one whole eye. It's both sides of the brain because the right eye goes to both sides and the left eye does, but it's the brain cells that run that eye just go away. So you become blind and you don't get that back. So just by ignoring it, just because it's being ignored, it goes away. That's a pretty concrete thing that you can imagine, you can see, you can see the results. And uh, connections that aren't used go away. Now, to prevent this, the get going away of those brain cells, so we, we don't want that X to be there. To prevent it, we patch one eye. He's happier because now he's not seeing double, but that eye that's patched is still at risk because it's still not being attended to. So we have to switch the patch back and forth. So we feed one eye, and then a little while later, we feed the other eye a while, so those brains stay still, and then we can get them both until we can figure out what to do. So maybe we have to surgically do it. Maybe we just need to put glasses on, and once they're clear vision, he can pull them together. Maybe a little bit of time does that, but we can keep them both alive. The problem is some of the things that go away are really harder to do. What if a kid's attachment mechanisms are fading away? The part of his brain that helps him know how to connect with people and make attachments, and there isn't anybody around for that, and they're starting to go away, or nobody's interacting with them, or in some ways at worst, we say, you're, you're not safe there, so we're gonna break that attachment for you. We're gonna make that attachment go away because that person's not safe. Well, there's, there's not a patch that we can just apply and let's keep that brain, part of his brain alive. The only thing we can do is keep them connected to people and ideally connected to that person. Even if they're not safe, you can still keep them connected. My wife reads bedtime stories to the toddlers in Alaska who pull their chair up to the computer and she reads it on Skype and she's, you know, reads, here's the book today. And, you know, we can do so much of keeping people connected safely. We just have to use technology and all kinds of things because we shouldn't ever break connections unless there's just no other way because it's painful and because it has a, you know, you're not going to have attachments to keep that part of your brain alive. Okay, 2.3 is, is kind of a concept graph here. It's not data graph, and I just made a general concept here. So don't, don't take this and sort of say what's the axes, but I'm, parts of the brain development happen at different times. And at birth, what are kids really good at? They're really good at engaging. They can engage an adult. 
I mean, that's all those amazing things they can do. They can start, you know, breastfeeding, and then breastfeeding is pumping hormones into that mom that are fostering <laughs> attachment as well as all of the other things that are fostering attachment. So that baby has control of that mom's brain at birth. They can make any adult look at them. I mean, because they're looking right back, and it's just hard not to look at a little kid that's looking straight at you wide-eyed. So engagement is an early thing. That's not the same as attachment, but it's definitely they recognize smells, they recognize sounds, they have all kinds of things that keep them engaged or, or make adults engage with them. Well, that's good because, and that's a little one of my little twin grandchildren from Australia, and they're up here in Lincoln now, so that's great. I've been engaging directly, but we already did that Skyping and all kinds of things. So from the first breath, they start engaging, they look at faces, they cause caring responses in adults. When they cry, they cause lactation in the mom who's breastfeeding. I do a talk on, on uh, colic and shaken baby syndrome, and I've had trainees that had to leave because I play a crying baby and, and they just uh, take a little break because they were breastfeeding. But they have control over the adults in them. That's amazing. It's built in before they even are out there. But then attachment starts coming in later. It doesn't really come in, you know, first two months, there's no way we can measure anything we would call attachment. If a parent dies and another parent or another person is there replacing and doing all the things a parent should do, a two-month old is not gonna show a physiologic mourning like a five-month-old probably will and an eight-month-old will definitely show that mourning. So sometime after engagement, there's a real strong attachment need, drive, brain cells are all ready to get in place for attachment. So over that time, and by the kid, time the kid's you know, seven, eight, nine months old, you know that they're attached and you know they can behave in that way. At birth, they engage people, but they don't even know that an adult, or that a, the person they're looking at is still in the universe when they're not in the room. I mean, they don't have that concept. They can't build a person into their brain like you have to do for, for attachment. But then you start attaching. And then I'm put fear here, not because earlier kids don't get afraid, but attachment trumps fear in the first year, probably. A parent who's really bad to their kid, that doesn't matter to attachment. Rats who get shocked every time their mom is around still attach to that person, or the mom walks on them. The attachment has trump. Uh, and that makes sense, because they're gonna not live if they're not attached to somebody. And we know that, so the, the brain is really good at that. Strong attachments, and strong attachments buffer stress and fear all the way. So no matter how old you are, if you have strong attachments, that's a buffer. So fear comes in there, but then control starts coming in, you know, two years to three years, well, the most important thing is they're getting higher cortical functions and figuring out what they do with those fear responses or those other emotional things, anger, frustration, all those things, they, they're learning that control. That's a higher cortical thing, and that's what all the preschool teachers and all the parents of uh, two to three and four-year-olds are really watching happen and hopefully helping happen. So they take turns, a time and a place for each function to come in, um, and then higher functions um, develop some control over those emotional things. People ask, what's more important, nature or nurture? I mean, they're born with genetics and they're, they have all kinds of events. Are they bad because they're genetics or are they bad because of the events? Or, and yours is a little more complicated. Which kind of events? Is it the parental home events or is it uh, something broader? But it's both. Think about an area of a rectangle. Which is more important to the area of that rectangle, the width or the height? Well, it doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, every piece of that area, every piece, is dependent on both the width and height. You can't look at that and say, well, the width's bigger than the height, so maybe it's 60% width and 40% height. Well, we say that all the time about genetics, nature, and nurture. You see all kinds of articles written and everything about how much of something is genetic, but it really doesn't have any real meaning because everything is a combination of both from the day of conception. I mean, even things that we say are really strong and genetic, they only develop if they're in the right kind of environment in utero and all of that. So it's the interaction between the two. So everything about the area is due to width and height, and that's true for a child. Everything is due to the nature, all the genes that the kid was born with, and 
on the experiences. But there's a problem. Actually, there's lots of problems. But one of the problems is just like with the area. You can't separate anything he's doing that is only due to genes or only due to environment. But there's other problems too. For example, the genes are pretty finite and pretty measurable. We know there's about 30,000 genes and we can take a little hair from that kid and we can measure every single gene. We can know exactly what genes are in that kid. How do you measure every single nurture? <laughs> you know, it's infinite because every kid by the time they're probably a, a half a day old has you know, more experiences than they have genes and it just keeps going on. I'm really impressed with that new research on kids when they're three, if they're in poverty, they hear 30 million words less than kids that are in just normal middle class families. 30 million words less from the people close to them. And their vocabulary is much less. And that explains a lot of the difference between educational performance between poverty and middle class or higher. So how do you measure that? But the problem is, because you can measure genes, you see all kinds of articles that say, oh, this is the gene for addiction. This is the gene for hyperactivity. This is the gene for, and there aren't any genes for things. There are genes which interact with environments which may make you more likely to have them. But nobody can ever say this is the environment for, well, you can some really bad trauma without attachments, but, but basically we can't do that kind of research with the environment. Now the genes are more complicated. We know that now. You have 30,000, but they're not all turned on at the same time. They're turned on at different times. And so some of those genes are off and some of them are on in a given person, and we can't even measure that very well. But there's a switch for turning genes on and turning off. And now we know that some environmental things throw that switch. So that instead of being on, it's now switched off. And that's what we call epigenetics. And it just adds to the whole complication. What we thought we knew about genetics was so simple when we first got the double helix. And now we know, you know it's not anywhere close to that. But we do know that you can change your genetic expression by things that happen in your environment. Trauma, for example, can change the expression of different genes.